we're on to the epilogue and afterward. Epilogue, California, 1955. There is no bad that something good doesn't come from. Mexican proverb. Sylvia, Santa Ana, California. I'm so proud of you, said Sylvia's father. So proud. He stepped back to admire his daughter in her graduation cap and gown. This is an important day, her mother said, straightening the red and blue tassel hanging down from Sylvia's square mortarboard. I know, Sylvia said. She knew that when she stepped onto stage, shook hands with the principal, and reached for her high school diploma, she would represent her entire family. You look so grown up, her mother said. You're such a beautiful young lady. Sylvia hugged her mother. Don't make me cry. Come on, her father said, taking her mother's arm. Let's take our seats. Just a few minutes later, the band played Pomp and Circumstance while the Santa Ana High School class of 1955 entered the auditorium. Sylvia and her classmates marched through the crowd and filled the front rows. After she took her seat, Sylvia admired her ring, gold with a faceted red stone and class of 1955 etched on the sides. Her long, thin fingers and neatly trimmed fingernails reminded her of her father's hands, always so clean. Thinking of him, she felt a touch of regret that he had never had a chance to wear a class ring of his own. After the principal welcomed everyone, the class valedictorian took the stage. Fellow students, we are coming of age at a unique time in our nation's history, he said. This is a time of unparalleled opportunity for students of every race and color. One year ago, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education Topeka, unanimously ruled that schools could no longer separate children by race. We, all of us stand on the threshold of a new day. Equality in education is the first step toward equality in opportunity. Sylvia felt her heart blossom with pride. Equality in opportunity. That was what her father had been fighting for. His lawsuit had focused on children in Orange County, but after he won, it inspired the governor of California to make school segregation illegal all over the state. The Brown versus Board of Education Topeka lawsuit was a lot like her father's case, only it protected children all over the country. Each one of you has a mission in life, the valedictorian continued. Your mission is not something you learn in school. It cannot be told to you by someone else. It comes from deep inside of you. It is the thing you have been put on this earth to do. Sylvia thought back to the day she had turned away from Westminster School, had been turned away from the Westminster School, because her skin was brown and her last name was Mendez. She looked left and right at her classmates and saw white, brown, and black faces. My father helped make this happen, she thought. My father helped bring us together. In that moment, Sylvia savored the full impact of what her father had done for her. No, not just for her, for Mexican students across California. Her father had taken a stand and made the world a better, fairer, and more just place. And all these years later, she and her classmates were reaping the rewards of his efforts. You did it, Dad. You are the one I'm proudest of today. After the speeches were over and the diploma had been handed out, the principal turned to the audience and said, I now present the graduates of the Santa Ana High School class of 1955. As one, Sylvia and her classmates took off their, cap, their graduation caps, tossed them into the air, and cheered. Afterward, a note about the Mendez family. Sylvia and her brothers did briefly attend Westminster School before the lawsuit and its appeals were finally resolved. After leaving the asparagus farm, the Mendez family returned to Santa Ana, California. Sylvia graduated from high school, attended California State University in Los Angeles, and became a registered nurse. Gonzalo Mendez died of heart disease in 1964 at age 51. Felicitas Mendez, Sylvia's mother, lived until 1998, just long enough to see the groundbreaking for a new school in Orange County named the Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez Elementary School in honor of their accomplishments. In October 2007, a U.S. postage stamp was issued honoring the 60th anniversary of Mendez versus Westminster. In 2011, President Barack Obama awarded Sylvia the Medal of Freedom, the country's highest civilian honor. A note about the Munimitsu family. The Munimitsu family stayed on the farm in Westminster for several years after the end of World War II. They invited a number of displaced Japanese families to stay with them and work on the land in the years after the internment camps closed. Even after the internment camps, my father still believed in the American dream, said Aki. 
He wanted to help other families save money and start over. He did not believe in self-pity. Japanese Americans lost an estimated $200 million when they were forced into the camps. Some of them recovered a small part of their financial losses through the 1948 Evacuation Claims Act and another redress payment through the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which provided an official apology and payment of $20,000 to each surviving internee. The Munamitsu family received their payment and donated the entire sum to the Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles. Sylvia Mendez and Aki Munamitsu both live in Southern California. They lost touch with each other for years, but were reacquainted as adults and remain friends to this day. The End of School Segregation in America On February 18, 1946, almost one year after Gonzalo Mendez v. Westminster School District of Orange County was filed, Sylvia's father won his lawsuit. Much of the courtroom dialogue used in Chapter 11 of this book is drawn almost verbatim from court records. The judge in the case, U.S. District Court Judge Paul J. McCormick, ruled that Mexican children in Orange County, California had the legal right to go to school with white children. More specifically, the judge ruled that California law did not allow local governments to create Mexican schools. In his written opinion, the judge held that segregation, in this case separating students by race, quote, fosters antagonisms in the children and suggests inferiority among them where none exists, quote. In other words, having separate white and Mexican schools was unfair and wrong, and with the judge's decision, it became illegal in Orange County, California. The school board didn't accept the judge's ruling. On December 10, 1946, the attorney for the school board filed an appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. He hoped that the higher court would agree with the school board and overrule the lower court's decision. During this time, the United States was going through a period of great social change. Before World War II, most people accepted the separation of people by race. After the war, Mexicans, African Americans, and other people of color questioned the fairness of racial segregation. After all, brave men and women of all races had fought together and risked their lives to protect freedom and democracy on the other side of the world. When they got home, they wanted to be able to enjoy the same privileges as everyone else. Some people feared racial integration. They justified school segregation by arguing that the schools were separate but equal. Many children like Sylvia Mendez knew from experience that separate rarely meant equal. In the mid-1940s, many civil rights lawyers were looking for a lawsuit that could be used to overturn what was known as the separate but equal doctrine. Some attorneys thought that Gonzalo Mendez versus Westminster School District of Orange County might be the case to do it. One of the attorneys watching the Mendez case was Thurgood Marshall of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. He and several of his co-workers filed friend of the court arguments in the appeal of the Mendez case, arguing that separate but equal was inherently unjust. Additional friend of the court briefs were filed by the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, the National Lawyers Guild, and the American Jewish Congress, and the Japanese American Citizens League. The school board lost the case. On April 15, 1947, the seven judges of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco unanimously affirmed the lower court's decision. While the court ruled in favor of Mendez, it used another legal argument that did not address the question of race or the legality of the separate but equal doctrine. In response to the case, the state of California reviewed its own policies involving race and education. School segregation in California officially ended in June 1947 when Governor Earl Warren repealed all state laws that separated school children on the basis of race, ethnicity, or language. Children of all races could finally attend school together in California. The Mendez case had an impact nationwide. Families in other states also wanted the best possible education for their children. After the Mendez case, similar lawsuits were filed and won in Arizona and Texas. The Mendez case also influenced the landmark lawsuit Brown v. Board of Education Topeka, which made school segregation illegal nationwide. In 1954, Thurgood Marshall filed a lawsuit involving a young African-American girl who wanted to attend an all-white school seven blocks from her home, instead of an all-black school a mile away. This was the case that would change history, and Thurgood Marshall used many of the same legal arguments he had tested in the brief he wrote for the Mendez case. 
In an interesting coincidence, Earl Warren, the man who banned legal segregation in schools when he was governor of California, went on to serve as Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. He presided over the court when Thurgood Marshall argued the Brown case, and he wrote the unanimous 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision that struck down school segregation across America. While it was the Brown case that ended segregation nationwide, many people refer to the Mendez case as the Brown versus Board of Education for Mexicans. Japanese internment camps. During World War II, more than 120,000 people of Japanese descent living on the west coast of the United States were held in internment camps. They were imprisoned, many of them for years, even though there was no evidence that they had done anything wrong. They were never charged with any crime, and they never faced a jury of their peers. The first major step in this massive internment program began on February 19, 1942, a few months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, creating wartime internment camps to hold Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants. One month later, the president signed another executive order authorizing the relocation of all people of Japanese ancestry. This order applied to both Japanese citizens living in the United States and American citizens of Japanese descent. The federal government quickly built 10 relocation camps, most in the Southwest. The facilities were hastily constructed and lacked privacy. Some of the early residents at the camps were forced to build the barracks and facilities for those who would come after them. The first of the camps, Manzanar opened on March 22, 1942. At first, the internment program focused on suspected enemy aliens, especially male immigrants who were leaders in the Japanese community, such as Buddhist priests, Japanese language teachers, and newspaper editors. People who owned land, such as the Munamitsus, were also considered high risk. In the following months, the internment camps were filled with women and children. At Poston, as at the other internment camps, an economy developed. The War Relocation Authority paid $19 a month to professionals, such as medical doctors, who worked in the clinics, $16 to skilled workers, such as masons or bricklayers, and $12 to unskilled workers, such as Aki's mother, who worked in the kitchen. Despite their treatment, the vast majority of Japanese Americans remained loyal to the United States. During World War II, thousands of Japanese volunteered for military service. During the war, some 33,000 Japanese Americans fought for the United States, including the celebrated men of the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, who together became known as the Purple Heart Regiment for their sacrifices. By the end of the war, these groups had earned 18,143 individual awards of valor, becoming the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the history of the United States. On Jap January 2nd, 1945, President Roosevelt repealed the executive order establishing the internment camps. The mass evacuation program happened again, this time in reverse, as families were released from the camps. The final internment camp, Tool Lake, was closed in March 1946. In the final accounting, only 10 people were convicted of spying for Japan during World War II, and all of them were white. Not a single Japanese American citizen was found to be disloyal to the United States. I hope you enjoyed reading Sylvia and Aki with me. It was my first time reading through it and it was just a fantastic read. I personally love books that tell a story uh, from two different perspectives, but in the first person so I can personally connect with each of the characters. And if you'd like some more ideas on what to read next, please uh, switch over to my playlist on Read Aloud Book Tours. Thank you so much for joining me on my first chapter to chapter. Take care.